we have the great fortune to have with us today the chairman of the Eurogroup, uh, who continues to be chairman until uh, next January. Uh, he's in his second term as chairman of the Eurogroup. Uh, Jeroen has been Minister for Finance for, for some years in the Netherlands until uh, the recent election. And from next Thursday, he will be taking up a special position as a special advisor uh, to, to the ESM to continue with the work that's been going on there. Um, as I said to him as we met first just over lunch, I said we're, we're all far more interested in hearing uh, what's been going on and where he's heading uh, than in what he's been doing for the last 20 years. So I'll skip the whole biography uh, and simply say that he is only the second person to hold the share of the Eurogroup. He's, as I say, coming to the end of his second term. And it's been a group that has had a major influence on thinking about economic and monetary policy uh, in the member states. And one which will, I think, clearly have a very important role to play in the future development uh, of EU27. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about banking union and capital markets union. On both of which subjects, Jeroen has had uh, some very interesting things to say uh, very recently. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and um, to talk at the Institute. Um, uh, I am indeed in my last days as a minister, so just in time. That is to say, anything uh, you want to ask about the Netherlands, you can do. Uh, after Thursday, I'm only available for Eurozone matters. <laughs> So um, I will talk about the Eurozone, and I will go back a bit in time, because I think it's uh, useful to look back at the years behind us um, and the lessons that we've learned from that. Uh, and then, of course, I'll go to the future of the monetary union, which is heavily debated. And in the coming months, hopefully, um, there will be some progress and looking for decisions, perhaps in December or January, uh, on that uh, uh, topic. So I think where we stand now, uh, if you look now at the Eurozone, it's, um, it's been a, a huge achievement. Um, growth has returned to all of our uh, member states. I believe we now have, in the Eurozone, the 17th consecutive quarter, consecutive quarter of growth. Uh, average uh, growth at about 2, 2.1% in the Eurozone. Of course, still with some big differences, uh, but a very strong uh, recovery uh, at the moment. Growth is quite broad-based. It's uh, built on exports growing in many member states, consumer demand uh, picking up, and also investments. Uh, less so still uh, government expenditures, because the fiscal effort to redress um, uh, deficits and to uh, bring down sovereign debt is still, of course, ongoing uh, in our uh, countries. Interestingly enough, um, at the moment, the divergence in growth and growth development uh, has been reversed. We have finally, for the first time since the start of the crisis, again, a sort of a convergence when you look at the growth levels in the uh, Eurozone. And the, um, the dispersion between member states and growth levels in member states has never been so low in the monetary union. So that's also a very positive uh, thing to look at. Another interesting thing to remark is that in those countries, in those member states that have done the, the most reform efforts, sorting out how the public sector functions, how markets uh, are open to new uh, companies and initiatives, uh, reforms in tax systems or other parts of the uh, legal system. Uh, in those countries, the growth is the highest. And Ireland is an obvious example, but the same is true for Spain. Uh, but the same is true for the Netherlands, where we are now uh, at about 3 3.5% 3 growth uh, this year. And also we did some major reforms in the last couple of years. So reforming, and of course it depends on how you design the reforms, you get it right, reforms pay off in terms of extra growth at the moment. To, before we start looking at the future, what's next? How can we develop the monetary union further? I think it's useful to just go back in time 
Uh, a lot of discussion is, of course, spent on have we done the right thing? Have we approached the crisis in the Eurozone in the right way? Uh, but even to answer that question, you need to go back to the pre-crisis uh, years. I think after the introduction of the Euro, we came into a phase in which money was cheap, financial sector was deregulated, uh, a lot of crediting, over-crediting took place in many countries. Booms were building up, uh, not just here in Ireland, but in many European countries, housing markets were over-credited and prices driven up. A lot of the credit that f came into the economies in the Eurozone was not invested in productive sectors, um, which would have been useful, of course. Uh, I think if you look at a country like Greece, where the credit flow to the economy grew massively in that pre-crisis period, after the introduction of the euro, before 2008. Um, much of that credit went to households uh, who consumed it uh, or spent it on real estate. Uh, and little of that credit went to companies that invested it well in productive uh, uh, sectors. I think macroprudential policies were uh, neglected. Certainly, the possibilities to control sound uh, credit policies and to control the looming uh, booms, many of those macroprudential policies were not used, not put in place, and risks built up throughout the Eurozone. So, yes, there was a link with the introduction of the Euro. Uh, the introduction of the Euro created in many countries very low spreads, low interest rates, and the av availability of cheap credit. But it was also due to the lack of sound policies, uh, macroeconomic uh, policies, financial sector policies, macroprudential policies, that allowed us to become very vulnerable uh, going into the crisis. So at the beginning of the crisis in the Eurozone, there was very much the sense that it was, the crisis was caused by the US and the US mortgages and the US banks which in fact uh, was certainly not the whole story. I think the major problems were very much domestic, uh, domestic uh, typical to the Eurozone as a whole and sometimes typical to the member states. Um, yes, you can blame the financial sector for being uh, so uh, lenient on the way they put out credit. Uh, you can say that they certainly didn't take the risks into consideration but here again, I think national policy makers were also, uh, should also take part of the blame, not regulating the financial sector, not making sure that they were well capitalized, uh, not protecting consumers against overcrediting, etc. So in the first years of the crisis, a lot of improvisation took place. I think it's only fair to say that we didn't have very strong frameworks, regulatory frameworks. Uh, we didn't have institutions to deal with the kind of economic shock that we had in the Eurozone. And it took years to build that. But we did. Um, I don't think the crisis was uh, wasted. I think it was used to st strengthen what we have in the Eurozone uh, and to build institutions uh, to support the recovery. Um, of course, a part of that was setting up the emergency funds, uh, first improvised and later on in a more structural way in the ESM. And part of that, but it came late, uh, was the start of the banking union. And I think one of the main differences between the approach that the US took after 2008 and uh, the Eurozone or the EU took was uh, the US dealt with its banks much more rigorous and much faster, for forcing them to recapitalize quite quickly. Uh, we also dealt with our banks, but we did it in a very costly way, uh, increasing sovereign debt in many member states, a high price for taxpayers uh, to be paid, without really going into the fundamental problems uh, in our uh, banks. The banking union was a more fundamental change. Uh, it was an element that, of course, should have been put up much earlier. We started it. Um, Basically, at the same time when Mario Draghi said, I'll do whatever it takes, the government leaders finally decided we must set up the banking union. And that was mid-2012, and the negotiations started. Uh, I came in at the end of 2012, 
the negotiations on that started in 2013. And already in 2014, it took off. And I think uh, even though it started much too late, it has been a huge effort and it's been of great importance for the economic recovery uh, and return uh, of trust in the economy in the Eurozone. Um, so, where are we now? Gro <coughs> growth is back. We have better institutions. We have more stability. Uh, fiscal issues have been addressed in most of our countries. Still work to be done. Uh, but if you look ahead, potential growth is still low. It's the growth uh, that we now have on average is, is over potential growth. We need to realize that when we say we have now on average 2% growth in the uh, Eurozone, that's, that's far over what we potentially ex can expect in the medium uh, term. And that needs to be improved. <coughs> Productivity growth is low. That's everywhere in the Western world. Competitiveness, very slow. Wage developments, lagging behind. Um, I'm not sure how that is in, in Ireland, but it's certainly true in countries like Germany, the Netherlands, where the economy is still, uh, is again very strong, but wages are lagging behind. Also, uh, our capacity to deal with future shocks is still very thin. Uh, we have used monetary policy, well, Mario Draghi will say we've never used it to the full extent. Uh, but you could argue that uh, we've used large part of the monetary uh, instruments uh, of the toolbox uh, of the ECB. Governments still don't have, it's uneven, but in generally speaking, governments in the Eurozone still don't have a lot of fiscal space to absorb any future shocks. Um, and therefore, we are still very vulnerable for uh, an event that could come in the next uh, years. So more work needs to be done there. We should really use this period to, at a national level, create that fiscal space to absorb shocks. Uh, I won't comment on the ECB policy, but you can follow my thinking on that. So we need to make sure that both on the public and the private side, the capacity to deal with future adverse shocks is improved. So what does that uh, mean in particular uh, at national level? I think we should really continue our uh, reform drive, looking at how we can create a much more investment-friendly uh, climate in different member states, uh, opening up uh, markets, opening up many protected professions that we still have, uh, allowing for new companies to be set up uh, easier. Uh, we should look at making our social model sustainable. A lot of work has been done there. For example, in the uh, increase of the uh, retirement age or the way that pension systems are being financed, a lot of work has been done. But I think to uh, make sure that the social model remains uh, and is uh, based on a sustainable footing, more work needs to be done. Uh, and we can provide, uh, we should improve uh, the, the public services that we uh, provide. This is about the quality of healthcare, the quality of educational systems, the quality of infrastructure still major differences between member states and a lot of room for improvement if we could converge to a higher level. At an EU level, I think my key priorities would be to finish the banking union uh, and to create uh, and deepen the capital markets uh, union. This is because I believe that uh, if you want to absorb shocks uh, in the economy, uh, the best way to do it is to allow markets to be the shock absorber. If you look at the US, the key absorption of uh, um, asymmetric economic shocks within the United States, the key absorber are markets, financial markets, labor markets. They have the flexibility to absorb the majority of the economic uh, effect. Uh, and let's not turn too quickly to the public side. Let's not too quickly make uh, what I would like to call uh, private risks a, a public problem. So let's finish that banking union. Uh, this is um, some of the elements I think are uh, easy in a sense that uh, political agreement is close. We have already set up, as you know, a resolution framework and resolution fund is being built up. Uh, but the open question is still about the, uh, the backstop to the resolution funds. 
if in a case of a very big banking crisis it will be depleted, uh, where would the capital, uh, where would the liquidity come from? Uh, I think there is uh, more and more support to look at the ESM to provide that uh, backstop to the resolution fund. Uh, a still more controversial topic, but I think we should really get it done, is the deposit insurance uh, scheme. Uh, controversial, certainly in, uh, in Germany, uh, but it's very much about how we can reassure uh, the critics that the banks are so much more sound now that we will continue to deal with remaining uh, risks and imbalances in bank balance sheets. And if the balance in how we design it is right, the balance between what is then called risk sharing and risk reduction, I think we should take steps forward on that. It's a very important element when we talk about rebuilding trust in the banking sector in Europe. Um, so let's first of all make sure that the private side of our economy and markets are in a better shape, better integrated, uh, and are able to absorb any shocks in the future. Uh, but what about the uh, MU? What about the public side, how we've designed the monetary uh, union? So I would say that on top of the national efforts in further uh, reforming the economies and on top of having better functioning markets, we uh, need to look at at least two avenues to improve the monetary union. Uh, one is uh, what Jean-Claude Juncker calls the convergence instrument. Uh, it, it's uh, an instrument coming from the EU budget, so we're talking about transfers, to members who would be, in his mind, converging to the Eurozone. I would open it up to all member states and say all those member states that are in a uh, reform drive, have a reform program that they want to do, should be supported uh, between um, connecting some EU transfers, structural funds to that reform drive, so we support them in that process. That's from the EU budget, in my mind, for all member states, and it's talk we're talking about transfers. The second way to approach it, and I think we should do it in parallel, is to look at the ESM. Many have argued that the ESM can develop further into a European monetary fund. In my mind, that means that you also look at the instruments that the IMF has and how we could use them or develop them <coughs> for a European monetary fund. Uh, and as you know, the ESM has so far uh, only provided uh, funds connected to a program to those countries that have lost access to financial markets. So this is really about a crisis uh, program and a crisis instrument. Um, but I think we could uh, develop the instruments of the ESM, or EMF, if you will, uh, further, introducing precautionary uh, instruments or preventive instruments, uh, supporting countries in financing some of the reforms that need to be done, or supporting countries in financing them while they are pushing for major reforms. For example, a country that would enter into a major labor market reform, but would have uh, costly uh, interest rates, could be helped in their financing, connected to that reform effort. Or even some of the expenditures that would go with the reform uh, if you do a labor reform, you may want to invest in skills or education in the labor market. Um, some of those expenditures could also be funded cheaply through the EMF. This, of course, would only be for Eurozone members. We're talking about financing, not transfers. Um, uh, and it would be done, I think this is an important element, and part of the debate. Uh, it should be done in an intergovernmental framework. The ESM is uh, owned, so to speak, by the member states. And its governance is it's run by a board of governors, which are the ministers of finance. They decide on how the ESM is and can be used. Uh, and I think to be able to make steps in deepening the EMU uh, in the next couple of years, uh, having it in an intergovernmental framework would probably give some of the more critical member states some comfort. Uh, so let's develop it further. Let's introduce new instruments to stabilize the economy of member states and support them in their reform drive, but do it within the intergovernmental framework. 
Finally, and then I'll stop, I think the key element for the monetary, the key issue for the monetary union is about restarting the convergence machine. Um, the World Bank some years ago called the EU a convergence machine. This was before the crisis. Uh, and I think we need to restart that convergence machine. It has, uh, if we don't do that, we have two risks. One is, of course, political. It becomes more and more difficult to remain united in the European Union and also in the Eurozone if countries politically but also economically diverge. But also our economic instruments uh, become less and less effective. Uh, also this is true for monetary policy if the state in our economies is diverging. So this element of converging is converging of our economies and our economic development is crucial from an economic point of view but also from a political uh, point of view. I think there are opportunities to do it. Uh, I think some of the landing grounds can already be, uh, be seen. Some of the compromises can be envisaged. And I hope that we can use the current political window of opportunity uh, to get it done uh, around the beginning of next year. Thank you. Thank you.